passionate about music. How exciting now. Uh, Debbie, I would say we've got one of life's go-getters here. Oh, I like He's that. an inventor, an entrepreneur, a multilinguist, and also novelist and writer of the sci-fi thriller The Looking Glass Club. Gruff Davies, welcome to Gaydar. Thank you very much for having me. We're also described uh, in Bent magazine as hunky gay author. <laughs> and we can verify that, You're going to make me blush. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I am actually say, blushing oh, now. No, right, great, you I'm made me blush. Thank you very so much. So I was going to say, so how long have you been hunky? Uh, well, I can't, uh, <laughs> since the Bent Magazine review, I think. Yeah, yeah. Before that, I was uh, a total oh, mayor. So, uh, well, uh, well yeah. where are you from? Where did you start? What's, tell us about you. Well, uh, where did I start? Um, uh, in terms of writing, I started uh, back in 1999, and I was uh, just starting to become an entrepreneur as well at that time, and uh, had some uh, beginner's luck. I sent a, a story that I'd written to... To, uh, I actually took it to an agent, uh, a signing of another author. And, cheeky! Um, I know, that's exactly what she said. She said, cheeky, I like it. Yeah. And wrote to me a week later and said, uh, I think it's great. What else have you done? Gave us some other stuff. Uh, she said, we really like that as well. Why don't you come in and talk about your writing career? And then um, I got sort of swept into a company that I'd started, uh, an invention of an exercise bike uh, that combined computer games with exercise to make exercise addictive. And, and so I stopped writing for a while. And also, I, I, I tried to write a, a full novel, and she didn't like that. Oh, and bitch. was very, very, <laughs> very, very <laughs> blunt about it, which is great. That's the kind of feedback that you need. Yeah. Um, and uh, and then when we closed this company that I'd started, unfortunately, in 2004, and I went back to writing seriously because I thought, you know, I was sort of licking my wounds a little bit as an entrepreneur, mm. and uh, started writing The Looking Glass Club and took it back to her a few years later. And she said, I love it. I think <gasps> it's a corker. And now so, we've got it here. And you do yeah, have no, copies in that. your very hands oh my goodness so, you've already made my brain melt <laughs> <laughs> on the back cover right are you ready to have your brain melted now no, go on, yeah, sure, right? go on. if we agree we perceive something is it real what is it real <laughs> let that soak in if we agree we perceive something, is it real? Oh. My head hurts. And that is exactly what the book is about. <laughs> it's about the boundary between perception and reality. So I wanted to uh, explore this fuzzy area between... Because you kind of, if you look around the room r right now... Rather not. You, <laughs> well, you, we're fine to look at each other. <laughs> you assume that everything you're seeing is being seen by the other people in the room, right? And yeah. you don't, but you don't know that. I mean, you assume that you can see this little globey world here and you can assume you can see the lip salve here but but what if you said you saw something and i disagreed and said i can't see that you'd start to question what's real or what's oh, yeah. is it imagine so and that's exactly what the book is about it's uh, and it uses uh, the conceit of a drug that causes shared hallucination so a group of university students discover this drug that starts to cause them to have the same trip rather than individual trips oh my and goodness shared trip shared trip and uh, wow. and they they that's what the looking glass club is all about and uh, it, there it obviously uh, has horrendous results otherwise oh. it wouldn't be a fun story i was so, going to say I'll spoil it for you but no, don't uh, swear. i was going to say yeah. oh, which way at that club are you? <laughs> going out trip. Yeah, going, yeah, out, going trip. out trip. Yeah. trip. Uh, but, but so I understand it's, it's something happens and then we then jump forward a few years to... That's right. So it's it's uh, it's what's called an A-B storyline. So you've got the A story, which is now contemporary story, and then the B story is the future story with the same protagonist who is now living across the pond in Manhattan under a, a new identity. He's called Steel. He's called Zeke in the contemporary story. And so it's 25 years in the future and it's... Uh, he's trying to uh, escape his past and so as the stories unfold you start to find out the link between past and future and uh, it's 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 um, it's a riveting read so I'm told. Can you tell us that fact about the blue lights? You were telling us before we, we came in. Well I'm, I've got this wonderful gadget here that's only uh, just become possible. It's a toy that uh, a few years ago just didn't exist. It's an anti-gravity platform. Right. It uses magnetism to levitate objects and we're giving one of these away um, for the Puzzle 20 so on a, in the draw on Tuesday, I'll be giving one of these away as well as another prize. And uh, this, uh, it's a very modern toy. It's, it's only just become possible. But it also uses another technology that's just become possible in the last 10 years, which is blue LEDs. They didn't exist. If you think back 10 years ago, you would never have seen a blue LED in anything. And the reason is that it's impossible to, uh, to raise... <laughs> 
electrons to an energy state where oh, they no. will fall back down and emit blue light. You can do it with orange light, you can do it with green light, you can do it with yellow light, but the, you can't do it with, uh, with blue wavelength light. And this very clever Japanese chap worked out that he could do it if, it, I won't go into the details of how it, how it works, but he worked out a way that he could trick the system into producing blue light. And since then, technology has, has changed yeah. dramatically, made Blu-rays possible, for Good example. Oh, so your Blu-ray player uses this technology, and I've got lots of blue LEDs in here. It also yeah. made uh, LED screen displays possible, because before then, you couldn't have... You need red, green, and blue light in order to make an image, a, a full-colour image. Yeah, yeah. So all of these technologies became possible in the last 10 to 15 years, just because of that one invention. So come on, show us how this works, then. Right, you, I'm going to levitate the Earth now. <laughs> oh, my goodness, David Blaine! <laughs> We're filming I am, this, so exactly. you better see and it on is, our website. This, this is where science okay. starts to look like magic, and yeah. this is what this is this sort of thing that got me excited about science as a as a young kid. Oh, oh wow! Look at that! Shut up! <gasps> oh, let's just no. there, you right, get, okay. There's a, a globe, pencil. and it's actually floating over this platform. If you get a pencil, if you can, you, get, you can. Okay. And Shut Debbie's up. now moving the pen Shut underneath is, the globe. Is that and not it's magical? Standing in space, I'm literally. coping the world. And it's actually it's actually rotating in its own orbit. That's brilliant. Oh come! That is incredible. No. So, and what's holding that up? What's holding that globe up so, in the air, in, our, in front of our eyes, with this nothing to This is magnetism. It? So, uh, but what's, what's special about this is that there's a magnet inside the globe, which I'm going to take it out in a moment. But um, it's not possible to have a static arrangement of magnets that will levitate something. Because what you, it's, it's, so if you imagine a hill that's perfectly smooth, you couldn't put a marble on the hill. It would just roll down. And that's whenever you, whatever arrangement of magnets you produce, you always end up producing a oh hill. You can't produce a hill with a little dip in the, in the, in the top. So this uses some very sophisticated sensors electronics that work out where by uh, induction actually by, by where the object is it works out how to change the field in order to keep it balanced so it artificially creates a little dip in that hill that you can float something in isn't that incredible now you can take the magnet out right very strong neodymium magnet here, and I can float the, the, the platform itself and it'll actually float a little bit higher than the, the globe did it's actually blinding us with science here. There we go. Now look at that. Oh, right. The magnet's now just floating above us once again. In, oh, he's put the pen on top. Could I just sit on that? <laughs> Can I? <laughs> it'll, only, it'll only support up to about 85 grams, so we'd have to miniaturise you. You've got a really big one, though. So, could, you, could you get a person on there? Theoretically, yeah. yeah. You could float. I mean, this is how maglev wow. works. You know, the trains, they float above the tracks. And because they float, there's no friction. So, uh, but what, what I'm amazed about this, this is a toy. It's a commercially available toy that you can buy that is actually... I tell you, I, I, want, I want one for Christmas. Oh, yeah. Anything else that you know that we are going to see in the next few years? <gasps> Do you know what? That, that was one of the most interesting things about writing the book. I make very near-term predictions about what's going to happen in 25 years. And some of them are quite, they seem quite outlandish because there's a, a concept called the singularity, which is this idea that the pace of change of technology is accelerating. It's not linear. And you, you can see that when every phone that you get, every upgrade yeah. of your phone does twice as much as the previous mm. generation did. Uh, so I've made these projections based on this accelerating pace of change. So we've got things like auto paparazzi, which are flying robots that serve the job of human paparazzis and just swarm around you and take pictures. Oh, I don't got, like uh, it! Android secretaries that welcome you into big buildings, you know. And, and, and actually there are prototypes of all of these things right now I blog about them on the website. Uh, you've got you know, objects that... There are two um, tennis bats that are f hovering tennis bats that can play a game of tennis with no human interaction. It's That's extraordinary. True. And so there, this is technology that exists now. There will soon be no need for us. This is the scary thing, isn't it? It's, uh, yeah, <laughs> it's exactly. It's Skynet. Is it, is, do you think that's real? iRobot. Do you um, think that could be real? I think we're getting closer and closer <gasps> to machine intelligence all the time. Uh, it's a fascinating idea that machines can think. And, uh, uh, already your computer does some pretty scary things, doesn't it? I mean, Niels does. That's why he has history delete. <laughs> <laughs> Can we talk about the gay brain? Because you've got a very interesting theory about geeks. I, well, it's, I'd, I'd love to say it was my theory. In fact, there's a, a chap called Richard Florida, who's a, a, an urban theorist, apparently. And uh, he did several studies um, over the last decade or so showing that there's a statistical correlation between high-tech cities in America, the 10 um, sort of high-tech meccas, are, uh, as they're called, also happen to be the 10 gayest cities in America. <gasps> 
and he, he's exploring the the link between gay geeks and uh, and economic prosperity as well. So there, there is now a statistical correlation doesn't mean that one causes the other. It shows that they're linked somehow. They may have a, a cause, a, a mutual cause that's uh, responsible for them. But it's very interesting that I think gay men and women are 1.3 times more likely to be in science or technological fields than heterosexual counterparts. Um, I think 2.3 times more likely to be in engineering, and uh, and lesbians are more like 1.3 times more likely to be in uh, computer engineering than their heterosexual counterparts. So, you know. There's a huge thing, and, it, and it's lovely to hear those sort of positive, yeah. affirming statistics when we've got idiots in, you know, saying in Libya or wherever at the moment that, you know, we're holding back the progress of humanity. It's, it's the exact opposite. Where Alan Turing being a great example Absolutely. of that. Absolutely. Absolutely. About music.